Welcome back, Blazer fans, to our final player review of the offseason. I am Sam Tung here with Dave Deckard, and we, of course, are going to the man of the hour, three-time All-Star and uh, and leader of the Trailblazers, and that is LaMarcus Aldridge. Dave, and so much, uh, so much to talk about. We'll try to pack it all into a, a nice little segment here, but, you know, LaMarcus obviously had a tremendous year last year, a career year for him. You match him with Damian Lillard, and all of a sudden you have a second-round playoff team. But really, you know, the the career regular season for him, he fought a couple of injuries during the year. But then you couple that with the first-round performance he had against Houston, which was historically good. Um, you know, obviously an impressive year from LaMarcus Aldridge. And, and now it really seems like this is the guy for the Trailblazers for the foreseeable future. Well, he's certainly a player that you'd love to build around. I know some still don't like him because his game is mid-range, and that's an oddity in today's league. But when you're that good at what you do, uh, you get to be you. And LaMarcus Aldridge has grown into his own skin, has grown into his role on the team, has grown into one of the best power forwards in the league, inarguably. And, yeah, the Blazers absolutely, I think, can be comfortable building around him. They have to build in particular ways, uh, but that's true of almost any superstar not named LeBron James. Uh, so they will probably try to do that. The ball really is in LaMarcus's court in every conceivable way here. He can demand whatever salary he wants. He can demand almost any playing situation he wants. Uh, he knows the Blazers are going to come after him strong when he's ready to sign a contract, and it's all up to him whether he wants to stay or not. And as long as he does, I think the Blazers will keep him in the fold and decide they're not really going to find a better option uh, within the next few years, and this is the guy that they want to bank on. Well, let's look at when I say that he had a career year. Let's actually look at some of these statistics, Dave, and, and see where he made his biggest improvements year over year, or, or regressions for that matter. And let's first look at the 2012-2013 season and his progress report. A true shooting percentage of 53%. Uh, he also took 17.8 field goals a game, so almost 18 shots a game for LaMarcus. Average nine rebounds a game and 21 points a game. So, you know, the, the 21 and nine, certainly nothing to sneeze at, and that was something that the Trailblazers uh, had already assumed was going to demand a max contract. And then you fast forward to this season, uh, surprisingly, actually had a dip in the true shooting percentage down to 50.7%. He shot nearly three more shots a game, Dave. Uh, all the way up to 20.6, and we can talk about you know that in a, in a second. But the with the increased uh, with the increased demand also came increased statistics in the rebounds and points. 11.1 rebounds a game, 23 points a game. So a guy that's averaging 23 and 11, um, and obviously a go-to option offensively. So when you look at these numbers, Dave, interestingly, the shooting percentage actually decreased for LaMarcus, but you could tell that there was a concerted effort by the team this year to make sure that he got as many, you know, 20 shots a night. Um, so there was clearly a concerted effort to make sure that the ball was in his hands at all times. And it's not just that he got the shots, it's where he got the shots. Uh, they go hand in hand. You look at LaMarcus Aldridge's pr progression. As a rookie and first, second year, third year player under Nate McMillan, uh, he was tabbed to go inside. Now, when Greg Oden came on board, uh, that lessened a little bit, but Oden was never healthy, so Aldridge became the default post guy. And he was good at it, and he was efficient at it. He wasn't comfortable doing it. It was not his preference, but he split the, the offense pretty well between back to the basket and inside game versus the mid-range jumper. Now, as the offense has developed around him specifically and has he has become the number one option, the perpetual all-star, he's gotten to take the shots that he likes, which is that mid-range, uh, you know, 15 to 18 footer, and he likes it, you know, sometimes with his back to the basket where he can make a couple moves, but mostly he likes to face up or come off the, the slipped pick. 
So that's that's his game, and the Blazers have given it to him. That's going to impact the true shooting percentage and the shooting percentage. They're going to go down, obviously, with that kind of shot. But when you've got Robin Lopez inside clogging up the middle, when you want to open up lanes inside for Damian Lillard, for instance, to penetrate, you have to take some of the offense out of the lane. So the Blazers have compensated for, for LaMarcus Aldridge by putting the personnel around him that can fill the void that he left, and everybody's happy. So, you know, it, you take a little bit of a statistical dip in certain areas to get him in his comfort zone and to design the offense that he likes, and that's going to work for the team. Well, let's now sneak to our bang for buck section here, Dave. And really, I mean, at this point, we're just talking about max contract players when you, when you try to compare what Aldridge is doing to other players. And we're going to be able to compare three guys. Um, I'm going to guess you can <clears throat> guess who the three are going to be uh, before we even get there. But <laughs> for, for uh, you know, if, in case you, you couldn't get it, uh, we're going we're gonna to do it anyways. Uh, LaMarcus first up on the screen, as we had mentioned, the 50.7% true shooting percentage, 11 rebounds per 36 minutes. Also, uh, something that we haven't mentioned at all thus far, Dave, the fact that Aldridge, uh, an improved defender in this system, really the, not only was the system designed around his offensive skills, but it was also making sure that he didn't have to be the most important defensive player on the floor like he was two seasons ago. So uh, that defensive rating down to 104, which I believe is the best of his career last season. Uh, player B average uh, shot 59.1% as the true shooting percentage, so a very high percentage value. Also, big rebounding numbers, 12.4 rebounds per 36 minutes. Um, if you don't know who this is already, uh, you've been probably living under a basketball rock here for the last couple of years. Uh, and also, 104 defensive rating. Um, and then the last guy, true shooting percentage at 58.3, so again, a very high number compared to LaMarcus. Nine and a half rebounds per 36 minutes and actually a better defensive rating than the two aforementioned players at 103. Player B, Dave, shockingly, is Kevin Love, who has a pretty high rebounding number, as we mentioned. Um, obviously, a very high true shooting percentage and another player that can play a little bit of inside-outside game. Um, and the defensive rating, which was comparable to LaMarcus. And the third player, uh, the third guy that everyone seems to talk in the same vein as LaMarcus is Blake Griffin uh, at $17.6 million a year on his salary. I should mention Kevin Love making $15.7 million, but that number is certainly set to go up after the end of this season. Um, Griffin also shooting a pretty high percentage, actually a better defensive rating than both Aldridge and Kevin Love. So, Dave, let's start the conversation. Uh, when you compare LaMarcus to these two other guys, A, are these the two that, that LaMarcus should be compared to in that elite level? Should he even be compared to these two? Um, and what do you see uh, that maybe differentiates Aldridge from Love and Griffin? Well, the first thing is where they get their shots, obviously. And again, that's going to account for those shooting percentages. Kevin Love benefits from a lot of three-pointers taken, which is going to up that true shooting percentage. Blake Griffin gets a lot of shots inside, has a little bit more limited of an offense, or at least more limited of an effective offense. Uh, so both of those are, are going to see that stat go up. And advanced statisticians, for that reason, are probably going to like those other two better than Aldridge. And, and, and fair enough. I, there are arguments to be made either way. However, I, I think the thing you can't do is uh, parse Aldridge out of this conversation because for, for what he does, uh, for the game that he has, he is just simply incredible. Let's put it this way. He is taking the most inefficient game, uh, offensive game possible, and making it look good making it the centerpiece of a winning team, a 50-win team, a second-round playoff team. Now, whether they can go to the elite of the elite level with that, 
that's another question, but has either of those other players gone that far either? No, they have not. Uh, Blake Griffin obviously has come the closest, but look, he's also surrounded by a much stronger team than either Aldridge or Love was. So, you know, Aldridge is transforming. It's like Chef. You ever watch Chopped or something like that, where they give you a mystery basket of crap ingredients and you're supposed to make it into something <laughs> wonderful? Well, the mystery basket that the Wolves give Kevin Love or that the Clippers give Blake Griffin is a little better quality than the Blazers give Aldridge, and, and by design, because like we said before, Aldridge likes this kind of game. But Aldridge is the chef who does the magic of opening that basket and going, huh, mid-range shot, and everybody else goes, ew, and he goes, oh, look what I can make out of this, and it's wonderful. So you've got to give him credit for that. And I think that, yes, absolutely, he deserves to be included in that conversation. In some ways, you might put him at the top of that conversation. I think, at, at the very least, he is able to do more with less or more in more different ways than maybe either of the other two. Love, you probably put above him, but Blake Griffin certainly isn't as varied, and you don't trust him in as many situations as you do Aldridge. Well, uh, first off, I should say it was a little surprising to see LaMarcus on Portlandia, but it would be a lot surprising to see LaMarcus on the Food Network. Um, <laughs> and and, the, and the, second, the second point here, Dave, um, is do you think that LaMarcus as a number one option is better than these two guys? I think that, you know, I want to ask that question outright because, you know, when you look at, at Kevin Love, you could argue that his his surrounding cast was actually inferior to what the Trailblazers has been recently. However, you start to think that maybe as maybe as a second option, Kevin Love is that's really where he can shine, is he isn't necessarily the go to guy. And we really saw too with LaMarcus when Brandon Roy was not playing, that's when LaMarcus all of a sudden blossomed into this all-star level player, but it really didn't happen until he was the man, you know, and when he was the second fiddle, people were really critical of his game, and then, you know, you obviously wrap in Blake Griffin and the fact that, you know, he is an all-star, he's obviously an, an extremely talented player, but if he doesn't have Chris Paul on that team, is he near the player that he is, so... You know, from my perspective, it seems like as a number one go-to guy, LaMarcus thrives in that condition more than these, these other two players do. But if you were to surround him with a better supporting cast, you sort of wonder if he would have the same impact that maybe these two guys can feed off of their teams. I think that question is going to really apply to Kevin Love this year. We're going to see because he's not going to have exactly the same amount of freedom that he did with the Timberwolves. He was basically able to do whatever he wanted. I'm actually impressed with the way Aldridge has been able to integrate with Batum, with Lillard, and with the team concept. I mean, let's face it, the Blazers are getting a lot of good shots. They don't take all that many bad ones compared to two or three years ago. Uh, some of that credit goes to Terry Stotts and the scheme he's devised, obviously, but a lot of that goes to Aldridge because he is kind of unselfish. He is uh, predictable, but also talented enough to make his predictability or his comfort zone really tell. Uh, so I actually, I would favor Aldridge in that discussion right now. I would put a little bit of question mark beside Kevin Love, although I think Love has even more versatility, so he has the potential to be the best of the three. Uh, Blake Griffin, I agree with you, needs to be set up. He is kind of the, he's a legit number one guy, but he's kind of like a designated lead singer in the band. You know, the bimbo who gets up in front and, uh, you know, he can only do one thing. He's got the long blonde hair and uh, he just sings and looks pretty. Uh, that's Blake Griffin. Uh, I don't want to discount his talent. He's really talented as a front man, but he's not going to be the guy who can then pick up the bass or play the guitar or produce the record or the all around musician guy. He's the lead singer. That's what he does. And, uh, you know, Aldridge, I think, brings a little more to the table than that. So, you know, it's hard. It's hard to, to dice and slice between these three and come out with a clear victor. I think Love has the chance to prove himself head and shoulders above everybody else as an individual and a team player this year. But I think Aldridge is still right on his heels. And if Love falters at all, you have to point at LaMarcus and say he's the best combination of number one option and team-oriented guy and versatile enough to carry both. Well, either way, certainly one of the top power forwards, really forwards in the NBA at this point, and that is going to wrap it up for this offseason of player reviews, Dave. So 
Uh, nice to get these these finally out of the way, but um, a lot of great content if you uh, if you want to check back on all of those, especially before the season. Um, if you're trying to remember, you know how uh, how CJ McCollum ended up playing last season, or if Wesley Matthews is really meant for the roster, to make sure to check all of those videos out uh, previously. And that's going to do it for us here today as we inch closer and closer to the start of the NBA season. For Dave Deckard, I'm Sam Tung. Thank you all so much for joining us here on this series. We'll be back with uh, a lot more cool things to come on the Blazers Edge videocast here for this season. So we will talk to you all then here on BlazersEdge.com.